So uh, welcome to the, uh, the second section of the mix. Uh, really excited to have Shauna Kazi with us. Uh, normally I would try and memorize uh, a bio in an introduction, but Shauna has done so much and accomplished so much that I had to take a couple notes to make sure I covered things. Um, so the thing about Shauna is her, her career accomplishments are, are as impressive for the moonlighting that she's done as what she's accomplished in her day jobs. Um, she's worked for some of the most respected companies uh, in the area, uh, the Mariners, Comcast, Nordstrom, and most recently headed marketing for Decide.com, uh, which earlier in the year was purchased by eBay. Uh, but as I said, she's also worked tirelessly within the industry and the community. She started uh, Tech Mavens, which uh, helps build the network of women in technology. Uh, she's the president of the Social Media Club of Seattle. Um, she shared her expertise with hundreds of nonprofits, uh, was named by Tech Flash as one of the top 100 women in tech. Uh, and I think I've just scratched the surface. Um, so the first question, uh, Shauna, is uh, last year about this time, you were on uh, CBS This Morning talking about retail trends. <laughs> So, fair to say this is a bigger deal? <laughs> <laughs> this is way more fun, actually. Sitting in the green room with, uh, well, that was, it was a fun experience, but this is a lot more fun, I hope. So. <laughs> well, nice of you to say that, even if it's not true. <laughs> no, it is true. Actually, it's true. <laughs> so, uh, one of the things that, um, that you've done so well in your career, Shauna, is, um, is really build a personal brand. Uh, you've got... 50,000 followers on Twitter and are a, obviously a respected voice uh, in the tech community uh, in Seattle and beyond. So talk to us a little bit about what the role of, of a personal brand is as you develop in this social media world and in your career. You know, this is a, an interesting question and I do get it every once in a while. People, um, even friends ask, you've built this personal brand, how have you done it? And how can, like, tell me the steps to create a personal brand. And what's somewhat interesting is like that term personal brand makes me cringe. It's not like I ever set out to like, oh, I'm gonna create a personal brand and here's how I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna create this facade of like these things that I do or, um, and so in that way, it feels a little bit artificial to me, the term, but, I, but then I, since I get asked it, you know, every, probably about once a week, I understand the idea behind it, which is like, how do you, um, and, and the way that I interpret that question when I'm asked it is, how do you involve and treat the community as a part of your overall network? I just, um, I think for me, I love this community so much. And I, I am, I want to be like the number one fan of all the startups here and all the, all the underdogs and all of the media outlets and GeekWire, you know, for starting GeekWire, you know, former PI and tech flash reporters, and they've had so much success. And so I think so many people have helped me and I, I really want to give that back. And so that's kind of the way I treat how I'm involved in the community and how I spend my time and outside of work and, um, and even inside of work. And thankfully, I've had these jobs where I've been able to um, still do some speaking, you know, when I'm asked to speak and um, be involved in the community and do nonprofit work. And so I think in that way, I never, I guess to answer your question, I didn't, I didn't necessarily set out to go, I'm going to have a brand. So even if you didn't, in, you know, intend to uh, get 50,000 Twitter followers, it, it happened somewhat organically. Uh, do you now feel a responsibility to provide insight or support yeah. <laughs> or to reach out to the community? Sometimes if I don't tweet for a couple of days, I'll get, a, I'll get some DMs saying, are you alive? Are you okay? <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I do because um, I think that people are kind of, you know, you're, you're kind of wanting to keep in touch with people even if you're not responding or at replying. You are reading each other's tweets and especially if you have somebody on a list and you're following what they're doing and their updates. And for, for Twitter, for me, I love to share. I don't really use it to rant. Um, or complain, or you know, like, I, I use it to share. Because you want to receive an end of that at Comcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I did. I even had a death threat. Is that at, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, Comcast was it was a um, challenging place to work in some ways because well, you were involved with Comcast Cares, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So customer service and really kind of helping to change, try to change internally the culture of Comcast to be more 
community oriented and more community focused. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think w one of the, so um, one of the reasons I probably have uh, the Twitter community that I do is because I actually prefer Twitter over email. I, I would love it if somebody, if I could get DMs instead of emails, it's 140 characters, you get straight yeah. to the point. I can respond to you right away with, with one sentence and it's not rude if I just say, great, sounds good, I'll see you there or, you know. Yeah. I mean, I still like email for longer conversations, but um, a Twitter DM, I mean, I can respond right away and email sometimes takes a while. So when I tell people that and then when, I, when I'm out speaking at, at conferences, I have my Twitter handle on there. So I think that's, um, yeah. and I'm really active on Twitter, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, the, the nice part about Twitter is that it is it is part personal and part business. Yeah. So are you, are you intentional about how you strike that balance, representing a company that you work with or for versus more personal tweets? Yeah, I, um, I mean, for me, you know, my personal life and my professional life is somewhat meshed, and I know not everybody's comfortable with that, but... Um, I'm not, there's, there's not really many things that I'm, can think of that I wouldn't be okay being, that I do, that I, you know, I mean, I'm sort of like, I don't really have anything to hide, so I'm not really worried about what's on Twitter or Facebook, but I, but I know a lot of people have, feel much more personal with their private life. Um, I mean, but then again, when I'm out having drinks, I'm, you know, with a friend, I'm not like tweeting the whole thing or, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> I just don't think people would find that really interesting <laughs> unless it's the best drink I've ever had. But, um, but I, I do, I, I think that get letting people, people want to do business with people. You don't want to do business with a brand. And that was one thing that really helped us at Comcast. And we realized is when we can be a person to the community instead of the Comcast logo that, um, people really respond differently. And when you're always dealing with a person, so why not? be able to have a personal presence instead of have that logo and so I've all I've never had my Twitter account locked down I've never you know had I've never felt like I have anything to hide and I've always even if anything I've used my personal account more for business than the logo because I know because I'm, I'm the one doing business with you or I'm the one talking yeah. to you about business and I'm not gonna hide behind the logo and I'm really you know proud of what I'm working on so yeah great yeah. well you, you talked about um, your outreach and support of the startup community and I think your uh, work with Tech Mavens is in many ways representative of the way that you've uh, been able to provide a, a network and support uh, for women in technology. So talk a little bit about what got you to start Tech Mavens and, and maybe insights that you've gathered. Yeah. Well, to be really candid, you know, starting out in the startup world, um, just didn't see a lot of other women on boards, as advisors, on executive leadership teams. And I didn't know how to help, but I knew I wanted to figure out how to help with that and help encourage people. Because I think one of the things, and I actually had, I tweeted this yesterday, this really great article about, you know, the, the biggest um, breakthrough for a startup is not your first customer, and this, yeah, this might be controversial, is not your first customer, it's not the funding, it's having somebody who is like the biggest fan of you and just there to support you no matter what. Um, and I really felt like if I, I've had people in my life like that and, I, and if I could help other people in that way or help, help connect other people with mentors where they could have that kind of a relationship, then um, that was one way I felt like I could help. Um, and so, it's, so it, it, I'm still working on Tech Mavens as a side project, and what I'm doing right now is focusing on women in tech and telling their stories. So we're working on a, um, an e-book telling the, the, like the inside stories of how, really just like what's their life like and how have they put themselves out there and taken risk and gone for big challenges. And, um, and so it's more of a storytelling versus like a look at, you know, I don't want to separate women and go, here, let's all go over here in the corner and be awesome and the guys go over there. I've never wanted to do that, but, um, but more of just like getting to know the journey of a woman in tech and how, and the challenges that you face. And, and I mean, one of them for me is right now I'm starting my own startup and I, I'm looking, you know, I'm, I'm meeting with people for funding and it, it's a personalized e-commerce uh, technology and I'm talking to all men for funding, right? I haven't talked to one woman. Um, and, you know, the guys are looking at me like, well, I don't know, would my wife use it? You know, and the, it's, it's, so it's not, 
it's not a bad discussion, but it's just different than if I was talking to women saying, you know, who, who would be the target customer and who would use it. And so I think, you know, slowly we're seeing that change. I, um, and one, one of the things that Tech Maven's led to is um, hosting a Startup Weekend uh, edition where we, um, we focused on women. So it was called Startup Weekend Women's Edition. And we flipped the ratio. So usually, are you guys familiar with Startup Weekend? Any, anyone not know what it is? I think one person, two, okay. So it's where, you, it's essentially a hackathon where you go, you get together for 54 hours, you have pitches on Friday night, and um, you form teams, and at the end of the weekend you actually show your demo um, of your, of whatever you've worked on. And a Startup Weekend is actually in more countries than Starbucks, it's really cool. It's, and it's a local, it's a local nonprofit here. And um, so we decided that, and so usually there's, um, there's not about 90% men and 10% women who show up at these hackathons. And it's, it's for technical and non-technical people. So we decided that we're going to flip the ratio and we're going to have, um, well, we sort of flip it. We have 80% women and 20% men. And so, so Tech Mavens has kind of led to some of these other projects in the community where I've been able to just encourage more diversity, which is exactly, and that's really all it is, is just having a little bit more diversity than we have right now. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. So uh, we've talked a lot about uh, your successes. Um, are there challenges that you faced that were, uh, you know, I guess milestones, so to speak, in your career that you were able to learn from and learn about yourself and, and move forward? That's such a great question. Uh, I think, you know, for me, I was really shy growing up. I mean, I was in high school, I was probably the, you know, the shyest person. <laughs> and I was deathly afraid of public speaking. Um, actually, didn't Ignite talk about this. And so I've, um, I've really had to ch challenge my, it's something I've never talked about this before. I really had to challenge myself to put myself out of my comfort zone. So actually, um, one of the things I did this year, um, talking about my personal life, is I decided that I was gonna put myself out of my comfort zone. Um, and try new things and I felt like that was going to help me professionally too because it was going to give me a different perspective on work and a different perspective than I'd had previously. Um, so <laughs> I did something that I would never have done a year ago. I decided to go to Burning Man. Um, I, wouldn't even, I, like, I wouldn't have even thought of it. A year. In fact, I might have like thought strangely of somebody who said they would go to that a year ago, but... Um, well, anymore, I think you could find people to fund your startup at Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized there's a lot of VCs here, and I went with a bunch of tech founders from San Francisco, and so it was, it was like, yeah, it was really helpful for work, actually, but um, <laughs> in a strange way. Um, and then I hiked Machu Picchu for Thanksgiving, and I, you know, I just did all these crazy things for me, and I think that I think that, again, that's where the personal and professional kind of mesh. Like, um, if you can continue to challenge yourself, think differently, think, you know, for you, I mean, I guess that term outside the box, just, just how can you have a different perspective than you have right now? And um, so that has been one thing that I've really proactively tried to do throughout my career. Instead of letting things happen to me, how can I go and make the things that I want to happen happen? And so, and so I, back to the public speaking, I was... I would, I would black out when I would go. I mean, I literally would get up on stage and I just don't even remember what happened. I would sit down and go, I think I said something. Don't remember what I said. Um, so I started being asked to speak. Uh, I went through this leadership program at 2008 called Leadership Tomorrow. And I'm actually on the board of that nonprofit now. And um, it helps cultivate um, leaders who are like manager, director level, like really for the next step of their career in their current jobs. Um, and it was a pivotal point for me because I really wanted to learn how I could give back to the community and I wanted to be on a nonprofit board, but I didn't know how, I didn't know my place in the community or how I wanted to give back. And so went through the program um, and just had an amazing experience learning about myself and then really had this motivation to get over whatever things were holding me back in my career. So I decided at that same time I was at Comcast doing social media and digital media work and we were starting to be known for doing a good job in social, helping customers and responding to customers within 10 minutes on Twitter and kind of offering unprecedented customer service. Like before you would call into Comcast, you'd be on hold for half an hour. Now you can tweet us, we'll get back to you within 10 minutes. Um, so internally that was a big change for the company. So I started being asked to speak and I, and I you know, it was when you're deathly 
mortified of public speaking and you're being asked to speak, it's like, thank you so much for the offer, I can't make it, you know, and then I was, so I decided I was going to spend a year saying yes to every th single speaking opportunity that came my way, so I ended up, and when you say yes, then other people realize, oh, she's on the market to speak, so let's have her speak. Um, so pretty soon I'm like taking the ferry at 5 a.m. to Bremerton to speak at the not, you know, United Way over there and just kind of went on this little mini speaking tour and um, very quickly got over my fear of public speaking, um, which is like the best way to, if anybody's in the, in the room is scared of public speaking or anything, just agree to do it for a certain amount of time and uh, you'll get over it pretty fast. Um, and, then I, and then I think that mentality of challenging yourself and trying to go for things and trying to do things that were hard for you or impossible for you before becomes a habit. And then you like it. And so that's sort of now, I'm, I'm like, if it's a challenge, I'm like, let's do it. Let's, let's, what's the next challenge, yeah. you know? So, so in that way, it's just, it's, it's made my life and my work so much more fun, I think, almost to a, have that mentality. Yeah, there's almost a void probably if there's not the yeah. next, next yeah. challenge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what I loved about your, your Ignite talk, about your year of saying yes, was the way you framed up that first meeting in Bremerton where there was, I think, five women in the room. Oh, yeah. And then you, you, know, you cut forward a year later and you're speaking with thousands of people in Westlake Center to tree lighting. Yeah. I mean, it just it was you know, the perfect outcome to, to a year of speaking. <laughs> Uh, so I, I want to talk more about uh, Decide.com. Um, it, uh, it was a, a company that really built a strong consumer brand in a short amount of time. Uh, so how did, you, how did you think about the, the challenge of positioning the company, building a following? Um, what was that process like? Yeah. So one of the things, I, did, I spent one year consulting for Google and that really helped me a lot, understanding more of the strategy level and how mm -hmm. that translate, translates all the way down to the tactic level. And one of the things I realized when I came in to decide is I felt like, you know, as a startup, you want to be iterating and customer focused and really figuring out how can you continue to innovate, right? You always want to innovate and think differently, but how do you get there? And I was fascinated with that path and that journey, you know, personally and for a startup of how do you get there? And so. Um, what I quickly realized is I don't think we were customer focused enough, but um, I felt like here I am as you know communications, sort of the non-technical person at the startup, and I'm the you know I'm talking to the customer, and then I come back to the startup and I'm sharing everything that I talk to the customer about. I'm sharing the insights, but what if the whole company could have a version of that? And so one thing that we did, um, which was maybe one of our biggest successes, which you would never know externally because it's, it was totally an internal program, was we created an insiders program where we invited our biggest fans that decide to, ha to be in a private community with our board. So uh, our, you know, our funders was, um, was Madrona, which is, which is one of the company, one of the investors that you, you work with, um, Mavron, which is Howard Schultz investment firm, and Vulcan. Um, Paul Allen's investment firm. So we just had this dream team of investors. We have this dream team, just like you guys, this amazing team, you know, that just, just so much talent. And, uh, and it was sort of hidden from the community. So I, I felt like if we could bring this close knit circle of folks into the, in, in as much as we could to feel like they were part of our family at Decide, then that would be a win for me. And then if we could iterate around them and get their feedback and their insights. We created this private group called um, the Decide Insiders. And they had access to our board, our full team, all of our data scientists, our entire leadership team. So me and, and our CEO, Mike, and Oren Etzioni, who was a professor at UW. And we would run almost every question that we had by them to see what they, it was, you know, so we asked, I didn't, I didn't let any media in, I didn't let any bloggers in, you know, it was just like our biggest fans. And um, in that way, it really helped transform our internal culture around really thinking about what do they think about it? What does the customer think? And we didn't always take their advice, um, but we definitely took it into account and we had a better understanding of would it be successful or not. And in the process, we ended up creating all these advocates. People would, you know, as soon as we were ready to share the news on social or if some, when we finished a project and we had had their feedback throughout a couple points along the way, then we would be ready to share the news. And, you know, CBS, we had, we had a really amazing um, PR run. 
uh, we had a partnership with the Wall Street Journal. When, when those types of things came out, then we would have all these people ready to just share it as soon as it was ready to be shared. Um, so I think, and, and so in that way, it was again bringing, you know, involving the community in what we were working on in a way that made sense that we was it was a trusted relationship. Yeah. So I have to ask, um, you know, knowing uh, your CEO Mike and hearing you talk about the company, the way you describe these passionate customers that you had, you get bought by eBay, and they yeah. essentially shut down the brand. Yeah. So I, bittersweet might be generous, I, I suppose. <laughs> But it was, um, yeah, you know, there's tough decisions that you have to make in the, in the startup process. And um, we had, we just raised $8 million from Vulcan a couple months before we sold. And, um, we, you know, we get this great offer from eBay. And it was just a really tough decision for us on the team of, um, you know, is now the right time? Um, you know, and, and what we, in the end, we really felt like, it was tough because we were so into our mission. We were so we were on the customer side. We were so about helping customers, um, and then thinking. Of, but but we didn't have. Um, we had a you know we, we were doing really well, but we we weren't reaching eBay type scale, right? Yeah. So bringing our technology over to eBay and building it into eBay, and then reaching millions and you know the world's largest marketplace, which is what eBay claims that they are and says they are was really appealing to to us to you know and, and you know when you're a startup and exit's always a good thing and yep. um so it was a tough decision it was it was a really tough and I, I should clarify that they kept the whole team yeah it was just the brand that was shut down yes yeah. our website was shut down and we we um the team is now working on uh bringing that same technology to help sellers know when to sell their items on ebay yeah got it yeah. so shifting gears a little uh we we touched on um, your work with nonprofits, and one of the one of the objectives for this interview series is to really think about career development, not just your job and how do you advance to the next stage in your company, um, but but really your career more broadly and and uh, and the role that service plays. So, um, tell me a little bit about how you started to get involved in nonprofits. What motivated you? What is it that's fulfilling about being involved that, that keeps you coming back for more? Yeah. How many in this room are involved in nonprofit in some way? Great. Yeah. So like 70 percent, it looks like or so. Um, I, you know, maybe I had a little bit of an unfair advantage for me. I mean, I love it. So that's why that's how I phrase it that way. But uh, growing up, my mom was the parks commissioner and she was appointed by the mayor. And so I you know, all throughout my childhood, I was going to park openings and talking to elected officials. It's so bored, right? I was bored at that point, talking to elected officials and another, another elected official. And um, but then I really got to appreciate it after college and realized that was such a big part of my life, my you know, my family growing up that I wanted to figure out how I could do that and give back to the community as well. And I, you know, again, feeling like so many people have helped me throughout my career and made you know, really made all the difference. You know, there's the moments in your career where somebody makes all the difference, and I really wanted to figure out how to give that back. So I um, went through this Leadership Tomorrow program, and part of that reason I did that was to figure out how I could, what was my place in the community where I really felt like I could make the most difference. So I didn't want to just volunteer at a painting project once a year. And, um, but I, and, and selfishly, part of it was I wanted to learn how to be a better leader, and I felt like, serving on a nonprofit board and just being put in that position, even though I'd never done it before, right? You know, sometimes you just sort of have to act like you're supposed to be there, even though you're not, you know, like, I'm out of my league, but you know what? I'm supposed, you know, I'm supposed to be here, so I'm gonna act like I know exactly what I'm doing, even though I'm figuring it out in my head as I go. Um, I had quite a few of those moments, um, because when you're on a nonprofit board, you're essentially the boss, right? You're, you're dictating what the executive director and the nonprofit team does. And as a board, you have to figure those things out. So I really feel like for anyone being on a nonprofit board, and, and it's, you know, I mean, there's nonprofits of all sizes, so many nonprofits are looking for people of all different skill sets, can be one of the best things you can do for your career. Um, and it translates right back into work and right back into your professional development as a leader long term. And you're giving back to the community. And it's just, it's just um, for me, it's like, there's no downside whatsoever to it. It's just 
um, I've just learned so much um, throughout that process. So uh, I would encourage anyone um, to think, just even think about that as part of your career journey at some point. Or, and if you want help or resources or want to know nonprofits looking for board members, I'm happy to help with that too, if, if anyone is. But um, yeah, I mean, I just, it's probably been one of the most impactful things I've ever done in my career. It is, yeah. it is interesting how, uh, how we're influenced, you know, as you said, with your mother and the exposure that you had to those things. My, uh, my father was a newspaper publisher oh. in a small town. And so you can imagine the newspaper publisher in a pre-internet area, uh, era, I should say, um, is involved in everything. Yeah. And so I was tagging along to every activity that happened in town. And it was only later that I appreciate, appreciated how unique that was. Yeah. It, it, is, it is funny. Um, so uh, you talked a little bit about your uh, sort of your first steps uh, to getting involved with nonprofits. Um, what other recommendations do you have for people that recognize that's what they want to do and they're not sure where to start? Yeah. You know, I think figuring out what unique talent you can bring to you know, w one of the things that um, that I talk with some of my friends and coworkers about is like oftentimes you can listen to what people say about you and what compliments they give you and learn you know just listen and learn what you're what you're good at through that, which is kind of an interesting thing to do like oh i've people tell me I'm good at this all the time um, or and or this is what I'm passionate about, and this is what I do in my spare time, and this is what I want to spend my time on um, and you know, and part of that is probably what comes naturally to you too. So, um, for me, it was like a two-year journey of number one, realizing that I wanted to give back to the community, making the decision that I'm willing to give my time, and then figuring out, well, how am I going to do it, and what am I going to do? Um, and uh, there are all kinds of resources out there. It just took me a long time to find them myself, <laughs> and it was just a journey. I mean, like I'm happy to help anybody speed that up because now that I've been through it myself. But um, but yeah, I think it's. I think it is. It, it's it's a it's such a personal thing to figure out because it's your per, you know your it, your time is so much more valuable almost than anything else that you're giving and so how you spend that and what you decide to spend time on um, is a really important decision and um, yeah yeah how did you I mean I think that's a really great question uh, you know I um, in uh, high school uh, I I dated a girl who was very motivated and I started doing uh, activities and volunteer work because she did. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> See, that's a great motivation. I mean, whatever it takes. Yeah, I mean, it's all about honesty here. So, um, <laughs> no, it, Do you but, still keep in touch with this? Uh, I do, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, Facebook and yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, she questions was... we should embarrass them with? No, no, yeah, yeah. Um, no, but it was, it was Partially uh, because my father was so involved in the community, and and then partially she was you know we dated but we were sort of friends first and um, and she was older and going to the Ivy League and so she was sort of a role model and mm. um, so that did play a role. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it takes. Yeah. Maybe you could, yeah find find date somebody that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not sure Selfishly, if that's the blueprint I want to date or not. you because I want to learn from you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, then you know, for me, just it continued on through college. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, people say that it's it's selflessly self selflessly giving, but I feel like it's actually really selfish. You know, I'm doing it because I get so much out of it. I get more out of it than the nonprofit does. So, they can call it selfless if they want, but I think it's actually a little bit selfish. Yeah. And that's okay. <laughs> I have a, uh, I have a college friend of mine that uh, uh, I can introduce you to at some point. He, um, he got involved with nonprofit work early on. The people he's worked for include President Clinton, Bill Gates when he helped him start the Gates Foundation, uh, Bono, oh wow, uh, Brad and Angelina, Kobe Bryant, and he he does all their charitable work. It's the most amazing life this guy has led. And so whenever I feel good about myself and the work that I'm doing, I just talk to him and I just say, it's so inferior, it's terrible. Uh, so I want to make sure we have some time for uh, questions from the audience.
Or we can ask some more embarrassing questions. If yeah, you want. Turn, turn the tables. Yeah, I mean, anything goes, right? Anything's on the table here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you have 50,000 Twitter followers, what's the filter that you go through before you send something out there? Like, is there a certain set of questions that you ask yourself before you press that send button to make sure that this should be tweeted or, or not? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I started my career in PR, so I kind of have a little bit of that mindset. And I'm also really, really, really careful in a way about what I share because I don't want to spam. I, I, like, I only want to provide valuable, the stuff that I find really, really valuable. Like, th like, the most interesting things is the only thing that I really try to share on Twitter. And I get people who DM me quite a bit saying, hey, will you please share this tweet? I'm trying to sell 50 ebooks today, or you know, I, I probably get that five or six times a day. These DMs asking me to share stuff, and that's not what I use my Twitter account for. Um, but if I find it valuable and interesting, and I think other people will, then I share it. And it's generally around um, technology or nonprofits, or um, I'm really into sustainability topics um, or leadership. So there's it's just sort of like the the topics that I find most interesting, and then the ideas or articles or things that are motivating or interesting around those topics are the ones I generally share. So I don't, you know, I, unless it's um, unless it's some kind of salesy thing that is the most interesting I've ever heard, I won't generally reshare that kind of stuff. And I also don't like if I'm watching a sports event, for me personally, if I'm watching a sports event, I'm not live tweeting the sports event. <laughs> Just because I don't think, even though I'm into it, I don't think everybody else in my feed is going to be into it as well. So. It's different for everyone. I mean, some people, that's what they use Twitter for, because they want to share, you know, they're watching the Knicks game or whatever, and they're really into it. Um, but that's just, for me, how I use it. Yeah. And then I have a Twitter list. So uh, I, you know, since I follow so many people back because I like to use DMs on Twitter, I have to use lists to actually follow people that I want to see their tweets, because otherwise I would never, I would never be able to see their tweets. Do you have a Twitter account? Are you no, active? Oh, okay. Curious. Yeah. Well, when you start one, I'd love to. I'll follow you. Right. I'll be your first follower. Can I be your number one follower? Yeah. I think we've got Kevin. Yeah. Can you elaborate more on how you changed that culture at Comcast? It sounds like you moved a big behemoth to think differently. So, yeah. it sounds like there's interesting stuff there. You know it. Um, there's one sort of pivotal moment that comes to mind at Comcast, and just I guess just being really candid, you know, it was a pretty old school culture, and I was um, in meetings. I, I was the only woman, and I was probably 20 years younger than anybody else in the room at these leadership meetings, and I definitely had a different perspective on, you know, just on following trends and on technology and. I think maybe a little bit of a different perspective on just the way that I was thinking because I was a different generation. And I realized that and it made it hard, it made it, it was a positive and a negative. Um, but there was, it kind of came down to one moment where um, I had been using and getting into social media. Now, you know, I'd actually been waiting for social media channels my entire career. I didn't like that thing where you have to write, a pr so at this point I was in communications where you write a press release, you send it out, somebody else covers it. If they get it right, they get it right. If they get it wrong, they get it wrong. And then I have to issue like a correction if they get it right, which might be in the paper two days later. I want to talk directly to the customer. I don't want to have to go through a third party or half, you know, I mean, I don't mind, but I don't want to have to go through a third party. So when social media channels started to get more popular, I just felt like this is exactly what I've been reading my whole career for. I can talk directly to more people and have a dialogue with them. And so there was one moment. Um, I, I was in charge of the Northwest region where all of Comcast was out. There was an outage. It was every, t every TV channel was out, phones were out, internet was out. And at this point, uh, Comcast services were considered um, you know, emergency services. Like you'd had to have your phone to make a 911 call. And so this was a really big deal that there was an outage. And it was the worst outage that we'd ever had. And, the, or at least we'd ever had while I'd been working there. And I actually worked there for eight years. And uh, the fo the, so many people were calling in that the phone lines were down. <laughs> so you call in, you get a busy signal, you can't even get through. And, and every, yeah, if you could use your cell phone, right, at that point, because your home phone wasn't working. So I knew that it was the right thing to do. So 
the old school way of doing things is you wait for King 5 to call or some media to call and then you and then when they say is there an outage you say you know what I'm not sure let me check on that and we'll get back to you a few hours later you get you might get back to him uh, <laughs> and then you know may or may not say how big the outage actually you know you, you might not you know, be very honest and transparent with, hey, it was the whole, the whole region was out. You wouldn't believe it. You know, you, you don't usually share bad news proactively, right? But I knew that the right thing to do was to share this with the community. So I went on Twitter, and this was back in 2007 when Twitter was, you know, there felt more like a community. There wasn't that many people on Twitter yet. And I said, we're aware of an outage, working on it. I'm on the phone with an engineering team right now, and I'll keep you updated on Twitter uh, as we go. And this was from my personal account at that point, because I, I started my Twitter account to help with Comcast increase. Um, that's how I started it, I, you know, with my photo and everything. And so um, I thought, I, I, I was convinced that 10 minutes after I sent that tweet, our CEO would walk down the hall and I might be fired. I just, it was the wrong, you know, it was like, it was so different from anything, any way we'd ever handled it before. And media hadn't called yet. There was no reason to proactively share that um, in the old school way of thinking. And I don't know. I mean, I thought maybe I would get, you know, I was just like, there's a chance I'll probably get talked to or, but I just knew for sure it was the right thing. To do. I mean, no doubt in my mind, it's the right thing to do. And um, especially since the phone lines were down. So what happened instead is I got all of these people responding on Twitter saying, this is amazing. Thank you so much for the information. No problem. We'll be watching your Twitter feed. It was like, instead of being upset, they were really happy that they had some place to get one kernel of information instead of just like not knowing what's happening. And um, so then a couple blog, small blog posts were written about how great Comcast was in this customer service instance and how this person had, you know, me had reached out and just sent some tweets. And um, I think we were back up within 20 minutes. And meanwhile, I had been sharing updates along the way. So about a month later, we are in a meeting and I get this call from Philadelphia, which is our headquarters. You know, I'm, I'm like this lowly, you know, I mean, I'm in a region, but I'm, I'm leading a region, but I'm, I'm not even on the radar of anybody in headquarters. Get a call from the leadership team at headquarters, like, what are you doing? How are you doing it? We want you to start helping the entire company figure this out because somehow you've got something figured out and we want to know what you're doing. So in that way, it was like, it, looking back, it was a real, it was a thoughtful risk that ended up working out. But I, you know, I, in my mind, I thought, well, I might be fired. <laughs> <laughs> and if that's what I get, yeah, if that's what I get fired for, then I'm okay with it, I guess. <laughs> I mean, you, know, you do something without thinking about it. I, if I thought too much about it, I probably wouldn't have sent it. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, you mentioned that you were really excited about social media channels becoming very popular. Do you find that you use other social media channels other than Twitter? Do you find that you almost exclusively use Twitter? Yeah. Uh, I use a lot of different channels. Um, my favorite one is this, feels like this personal social network. It's called Line, L-I-N-E. It's really popular in, I think it's, a, I think it's an app from Taiwan. Um, so I, I, I use that with my friends. That's like my new favorite one. But I also use, anybody in the room use Path? Yeah. A few, yeah, a few people, yeah. Um, that one's actually changed my behavior. I share thoughts that are going through my head with friends on that network that I wouldn't normally, I would normally share in conversation. Like, it's, so it's like the things that I'm sharing with somebody who are, is right there in the moment, I now would share on Path. And I don't, I, it's not stuff I would tweet. It's nothing like personal or private, but it's just stuff that I don't find as interesting if you don't know me very well, but if you know me, it might be kind of an interesting conversation. And um, so that's actually changed my behavior because I wasn't even sharing those things before, or, you know, typing them out. So I use Path every day. I really like Vine, um, V-I-N-E, the, the um, video app. Um, and then uh, what else do I have on here that I'm, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, pro I probably use too many. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess Line is one of my, f LinkedIn a little bit, um, and then I started using, uh, I, have a, I have a Nike Fuel Band, so I am competitive <laughs> with that social network. I have a bunch of, um, if, you're, if anybody's on the Nike Fuel Band, feel free to add me, I'll get, I'll, we, can, we, can do, we can battle it out. Um, but I, you know, I talk trash on there and 
have some <laughs> friends on Nike Field that are in the tech industry. Um, yeah, I feel like th you know these niche networks, based whatever you're doing, are now becoming social, and they're fun places. I even use my fitness pal and um, talk trash on there to people about. <laughs> I'm, I'm competitive, in case you didn't realize that. Um, so I'm, re I'm getting more into those niche networks. What, what are some of your favorites? Any others that you guys like that I didn't mention? Instagram. Instagram, yeah. Yeah. Run Keeper? Run, yeah, Run Keeper, yeah, yeah. OK. <laughs> I'll find you there. Talk some trash. <laughs> yeah. So I think that is a uh, great place uh, to end it. Shauna, thank you so much. It's been yeah. a uh, breath of fresh air and great insights. And uh, I know that I speak for the rest of the company in saying that we will uh, be rooting for you in yeah, your new startup you. and, uh, and feel the opposite about your readiness <laughs> to, uh, to be CEO. So thank you thank very much. You. <laughs>